think that's Jonathan Herbst, founder and CEO of Scale Up Growth Partners. Welcome to our Stories of Scaling Up series, where I chat with owners, managing directors, founders, and business leaders of scaling companies. It centers around their entrepreneurial journey so far and their aspirations for their companies. Today, I'm speaking to Michelle Schuberg, who's CEO at Curious, um, Curious spelt with two eyes. Um, welcome, Michelle. Thanks. Nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, absolutely, my pleasure. Maybe we'll, I'll ask um, publicly uh, you, uh, the question about um, that picture behind you later on because it's a fun <laughs> Shakespeare. Um, so tell me, what does Curious do and, um, and what do you do within the business? Yeah, so uh, I'm the CEO of the business and Curious is a software company. We have a plug and play metaverse for business if you want to use that that buzzword of 2022. Um, but basically, well, you're going to have to explain that to me because you know technological. Oh, do, do you know what? Let's let's say the internet as it stands is a two dimensional um, experience, much like looking at a, a magazine or a brochure. Whereas mm-hmm. the capabilities now um, allow us to have a three dimensional experience, so more like walking around inside an environment, like a retail store. So it's really yeah. the difference between looking at a brochure for your ne- next new car or walking into the showroom. So taking that perpetual 3D world and harnessing that to help businesses essentially build a virtual town square where they can house everything from their resources, uh, they can hold events, they can run training there, they can use it as a place to, to gather socially with employees and with their customers and just help bridge that gap that we're seeing uh, as a more and more evident challenge as the world evolves. So to me, I mean, does that mean I'm not wandering around with a mask and, you know, blind in a 3D environment? I mean, (laughs) So, you know, virtual reality is a fantastic thing um, and it is the gold standard, but it's also not terribly accessible. So we've designed our platform having a history in virtual reality and living with the barriers that that it does provide as well as the benefits that it provides. Our platform actually sits... um, it transcends hardware. So you can consume it on a on a laptop or a desktop, on a mobile or in a VR headset if you want to. But no matter what the hardware is that you're using to access the platform, you can still move around um, and physically engage with the environment, the content and the other people that are there. So if you think about Google Street View, if you're using it on a laptop, you can simply walk around and navigate around the way you would Google Street View. Okay. But I can do it from here. I don't have to come... In, into oh, someone's right. yes 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 you it's a it's a url simply a web-based okay. uh, so and um I, I so I'm, I'm trying to understand um yeah how would i okay so look on a, a ceo coaching business um how would i might i use um use it just trying to explain to people who are watching this um how, how you'd actually use it Yes, certainly. Actually, we do have a client in the US who runs a leadership training uh, business for um, corporate execs, and she uses it by um, housing a bunch of her resources, um, the skills that she teaches people um, within the platform as materials they can go and access, exercises they can go and access, pieces of video content, um, a PDF they might want to download um, as a perpetual resource that is available to them, but will then at moments in time host either live events and conversations. It might say, she might say, I don't know, the third Thursday of every month we're going to meet and pick a particular topic to workshop on and the entire community can, can come together. Or she, and, and she does run masterclasses and, and scheduled um, training programs that organisations pay for their employees to enrol in and they will come and, and um participate in that training program from our world. Fabulous. Yeah. No, I'm sorry. That was, I know that was a hard question. Yeah, Not at all. I think it would be a much easier question if I asked, you know, I'm in Mercedes dealership. Um, so how and long have you been doing? I know the company's been going for quite, quite a while. Look, the, but it, in its current guise, the company's been going since early last year, but the team have worked together for five plus years. In most of the team, I'd say three quarters of the team have been together for quite a while. But this particular business we've been running for uh, since early 21. Fabulous. Hmm. So t- tell me, who, who would you describe as your core customer, your best customer? So, well, our core customer um, from a from an organisation perspective, um, 
is really anyone who has an audience base they need to hold close, which is most businesses really. So um, we focus as a, a um, an enterprise um, on an enterprise audience rather than a consumer audience, although some people do open their platform of ours to, to their consumers as well. But um, the large majority of our customers are either wanting to communicate with and onboard um, and stay close to and help develop their employee base or do the same with their um, their own B2B audience, their uh, customers as opposed to the end consumer. So those sorts of people that you would normally hold um, a lot of in-person experiences with, whether they were training, whether they were events, whether they were sort of product launches, whether it was getting together around the water cooler, um, you know, as the world becomes more and more remote and that is the norm, we're needing to understand how to meaningfully engage and measure that engagement of, of those incredibly business critical audiences. So for us, you know, we are really appealing to large co sort of global enterprises who have a very broad and therefore unruly uh, audience base they need to corral. But we are equally um, we are equally uh, set up to service much smaller cohorts and much smaller audiences who have maybe, you know, 50 people that they need to communicate with, but but that communication is um, just as mission critical. So if you had a field sales team, for example, sales enablement is a wonderful uh, use case. If you have a, a sales team of 10, 20, 30 reps out on the road, um, this is a way of bringing them into the fold and keeping them close to the to the um, you know the brass tax of the business, but also the philosophies and the cultures of the business as well. That's a, actually that's a really interesting point. Um, yeah, one of the things I, I coach with, with clients with sales teams is, um, you know, one of the big failing sales, sales um, people make is they actually practice on their on their customer. You know, they actually get out there and, um, you know, do the spiel before they practice anywhere else and, and before they've actually uh, rehearsed it. I can I can really see how how that would work within your environment. You can, you can see. It's funny. I logged into the platform this morning and found five people in there who I didn't know, which was great because I was able to then, uh, you know, as the business owner, go and have a look. Ah, oh, interesting. They're all looking at this. They're looking at that. But if that was, if I was a, a, a national or state sales manager and I was able to see what my um, what my sales team were looking at most, what they were going back to. And then I love the behavioural sort of information data that we get out of that. You know, we have one customer to whom we were able to say, hey, you guys are all in there between 7.30 and 9 a.m. playing games and roasting each other in the chat. Why not go and be with them at that time? Uh, you know, we have another customer who always complained that their uh, their team were perpetually late for the first meeting of a morning. And we were able to identify that they're all in there actually doing work at 11 or 12 at night and they've got a cohort of night owls. So, you know, there's a lot of behavioural data that actually helps us understand who our audience is and work with them in a, uh, you know, remove some of the friction mm. in how we can communicate to them. Interesting. Um, but tell me, uh, we've all come out, you know, we're still in the pandemic, I suppose. Um, what are some of the actions you implemented um, during the pandemic that you've kept in the business? You know, I, I'm not going to say working remotely because uh, that's just, you know, <clears throat> part of life now. That is the new norm. Uh, the thing that I really love was, I guess, uh, that sense of humanity that, that it brought about. I love to celebrate that as the byproduct of everybody working remotely, you know, that sort of unexpected presence of kids and pets or the acceptance of casual attire and that ensuing sort of personal expression that that brings around or even just, you know, the realisation that a sharp suit doesn't necessarily add value to a sharp conversation. I, I love that and I love celebrating that because I find it a really interesting thing in the from a diversity and inclusion perspective, um, in particular, that it's a it's a real leveler of the playing field, um, and I like to celebrate that. And I like that, you know, no matter how together you are and who you are within an organisational structure, 
if you've got a cat, they're still going to show their butt to your audience at some point. And, you you know, we're all people, we're all humans. We all either have pets or children or something going on. Um, So it's the humanity that I I really enjoy celebrating. That's a a good point. Um, We're lucky it's sort of, you know, one twenty in the afternoon here. If it was three, three, three uh, and twenty-eight, uh, my two eight-year-olds would be coming in and saying hello to you. Um, yes. I mean, do you remember when that um, clip from the BBC correspondent went viral yeah. of his child going in and there were? I mean, it wouldn't go viral anymore because it would no, just be wrong. Exactly yeah. wrong. Exactly yeah. wrong. Yeah. Wonderful. So, tell me, what's the future look like, and what do you see as your main challenges moving forward? The future. I mean, the main challenges, I think, more broadly, are understanding how to connect to people in in new ways you know I I think we're at this incredibly interesting crossroad because you know lots of people are saying the pandemic drove five years innovation in five months and there's lots of kind of little catchphrases out there but I think what it did do was um, enforce an open mindset where there probably wasn't going to be one I mean try try and pitch remote working as the norm as a business model, you know, without any imperative and and see how that goes. I'm sure it wouldn't have gone so well. Um, But if this happened to us as a a global society 10 years ago or even five years ago, we would have responded in a very different way. It, It just happened to land at a time when technology was actually on the precipice of some incredible innovations and, and, you know, iterations, if not complete revolutions. So we have access to technology that lets us solve some of these new challenges that we face in ways that we couldn't before. And so for me, it's, it's that excitement. I mean, part of the reason the business is called Curious is wanting to go and find new ways to solve new and old problems. And I think, you know, we have a really open mindset in the world, probably for the first time, and we have technology that's evolved that offers us opportunity to do things that we couldn't have dreamed of even five years ago. And for me, I think, you know, that is both our greatest opportunity and also our greatest risk because I think, you know, the main challenge I see is, um you know, a very great divide between the people who are excited and energised by that and the people who are wanting to stick in, uh, I, I guess, you know, the old paradigm and are trying to recreate that or bring the world back into that. And so I, I see that as the tension. And from a business perspective, the gap between the businesses with one mindset versus another is is going to become broader and broader. In fact, Accenture did a really great research piece on this recently and and they've released a white paper about the technology leapfroggers and the the data that they have extrapolated around the gains that businesses that are um, innovating around IT, um, the gains that those businesses are going to make are uh, phenomenal. It's interesting you say that, if I may, a personal story. Because mm. um, you know, the technology leaps and the, the use of artificial intelli- intelligence um, has been extraordinary. Going back to 2013, I was misdiagnosed with a um, uh, a lung disease um, called idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, and I was given three to five years to live. Ah, so oh. Focus you a, a little bit. Um, as it turned out, there's a fabulous um, professor here in uh, in Royal Prince Arthur in Sydney, and she was one of the top researchers into this thing and I just happened to be lucky enough to be with with this professor tomorrow court um I, you know about four foot nine five children you're like just and you know one of the smartest oh, in the yeah. world and you know to find out whether or not I had it and uh, to put me on a special program they did a lung biopsy great right, general anesthetic and everything else well lo and behold you know luckily I was misdiagnosed two years ago in the middle of the pandemic blowing up a, a, a startup in 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 the US uh, raised thirteen million dollars to get the, to look at idiopathic uh, pulmonary fibrosis. Eighteen months later, they found a cure, and it's all because of the AI and all because of the computer power that they were able to throw at this thing yes. Yes. to analyze data from around the world. Yes, and I, I see your point, but you know we've got you know old GPs here who who, who won't even do a. Um, uh, send a digital prescription. It's it's this. Yes. Yes. 
Absolutely. And to me, that's the biggest threat or risk out there is, you know, even taking old, uh, you know, old information and slicing and dicing it new ways with the technology. I mean, we're seeing the gains in um, in criminology of, of, you know, going and solving cold cases because of the technology that we've got now that, that we could have, you know, we couldn't obviously apply back then. And, you know, the chasm between people who embrace that and people who deny that is just going to get greater and greater. I have a wonderful analogy. Well, I think it's good yeah, if, if we've got time. Yeah, of course. Uh, I was listening to, um, gosh, a long time ago, um, a, a gentleman called Astro Teller who works at Google. He heads up um, Google X. He's the captain of moonshots there. So he uh, was telling this wonderful story of being in middle America. He had a speaking engagement. He had the afternoon off. So he went for a wander through town. Local town hall had an exhibition on. Exhibition was on aluminium. He was like, it's like 38 degrees out here. I'm going to go in because it's really hot and I need to do something with my afternoon. He went in and and he was like, well, how weird. There's a coat rack here, a wooden coat rack, and it's like sweltering outside. Why is there a coat rack? And then he realised it had a plaque next to it. He went and read the plaque and it was the first commercially produced product using aluminium. And he was <laughs> he's like, this is what is wrong with the world. We have a cheap-to-produce, lightweight really durable alloy and we're making a coat rack and we're painting it to look like wood and and you know he used that as the example of people pointing new technologies at old solutions you know point them at old problems but let's not try and just recreate old solutions with our new technologies and and for me that's the premise of curious as business is looking at what new solutions technology is enabling us to deliver problems old and new fabulous mm. So tell me, what do you think is, is the biggest business learning you've had as a business owner? Oh, as as a business owner, I think you know, I think that there's uh, the people question is always a really interesting one. It's one that I've had lots of discussion with around, um, you know, how to build a really motivated, engaged team, and I think you know. Don't expect anyone to care as much as you because then you're really grateful when they do, but you don't expect that of them. Um, and let everybody care about their piece of the pie as though it is the be all and end all. Um, you know, you, you don't need everyone else to have the broader helicopter view. You need them to be able to focus on the bit that they're incredibly passionate about. And so for me, you know, understanding that the broader journey is my responsibility to them, not their responsibility to me, uh, you know, that's, that's a, a, I guess, a discovery for me. That's a great piece of advice. It's, it's interesting. I've, I'm <laughs> sure there's plenty of people that would disagree with it, but it, that's my experience. Well, yeah, another way of putting it is um, uh, with a diff, bit of a different take. Um, my coach, um, yeah, I'm a coach, I have a coach. Um, talks about your unique ability and the unique ability is what you're really good at and what you're passionate about and the idea being you focus on your unique ability and then you surround yourself with people with different unique abilities to complement you which absolutely. is a different way of coming at it basically. absolutely and constantly question yourself about when to hold when to fold you know yeah. that's a that's a, a constant you know you surround yourself with these people because they are experts and they are better than you are at what they do but then you're the one with the bigger picture view. So you need to check yourself constantly and go, okay, well, is this is this my instinct kicking in telling me actually this isn't the right course of action or is this my, um, you know, unconscious bias kicking in, in which case I need to park that and, yep. you know, and, and I think that constant conversation in the back of your head, um, you know, in the moment as you're as you're shaping and steering a team or a conversation, I believe that sense of um, self-awareness and, and personal accountability is pretty mission critical. Yeah. Um, so tell me, when you think of the word successful, who, who, who pops to mind? <laughs> Do you know, it's funny when I saw that question because that, you, know, you asked who the first person is that pops to mind and the first person that pops to mind is actually an old boss of mine and it's funny you say uh, about surrounding yourself with, with people. Her, she, she shouts from the rooftops that she's not good at anything except hiring really smart people, which, of course, is completely untrue. She's brilliant at many things. But to me, um, 
having known her now for sort of 20 or so years and seeing what she's achieved and the trajectory of her career and the trajectory of the and the experience of the careers of the people that have surrounded her mm-hmm. she's the one that comes to mind for me and I think the definition in my mind I could ask her um of her success comes down to um her pragmatism so she is very self aware very self-critical um a little too much a little too much uh, of course at times probably for her own well-being but um she will very quickly use a great mix of data and instinct decide the best course of action that she believes in and then back it with everything she's got and that usually involves her going out on a limb for the people who work for her to back them. And so so as someone who has worked for her, uh, you know, you know that if you have done everything, if you've gone right out on a limb to do something really audacious and important, that she will have your back no matter what. But if you haven't, if you haven't done it to your utmost potential, then you're in for it. And I think that it's really interesting that um, very pragmatic, is this the best it could be? Do we believe in it? Then we'll back it to the end or we won't. That very black and white nature, not leaving anything in the grey zone, I think has been a real key to her success. Are you prepared to name her publicly? Well, I haven't sought her permission, but I'll do so after this. I'll tell you what, you really need to go and show, show this video then. Uh, I should, I should, yeah. No, well, seriously, it's a, um, a a great description. And, in fact... doesn't like, she's not big on public right. accolades, but, no, but, but she's that, super, super senior at Google over in the US now and, and right. you know, does incredible things. But uh, you show her because it's a... Um, I'll show it. And I said here at the start, Michelle, there are certain, a couple of the questions I like particularly, and this one about successful is one of them because I'm getting such a wide variety of, of, of answers and such a wide variety of people. It's great. Yeah, right, right. And, <laughs> and you, you know, I guess the other thing is that, you know, she shows it doesn't come down to luck. It comes down to um, courage. Mm. Fabulous. <laughs> um, are you a reader? Um, do you listen to podcasts, blogs, well, any, any that you'd recommend? Do you know what? I'm a theoretical reader. I like love to absorb information. I love to discover new mindsets. Um, but I'm not a deep reader, as in I, I, I love to go and glean little concepts and little nuggets from as many different places as I possibly can. So this question around recommending, uh, you know, there's a, there's a couple of publications that have really sort of stuck with me over the years. Um, but, you know, for me, one of the things that I have long held dear was, um, somebody suggesting to me very early in my career that you'll never make something new if you only look within the industry that you're in. And so I've made a really big point of not looking as much at other people who are doing what I'm doing, but people who are doing something completely different who may have had some sort of similar challenge as a human, you know, in in some way, whether it's around making decisions, whether it's around, uh, you know, driving creativity for innovation and business outcome, you know, whatever that is, um, you know, you know, I, I love the idea of being able to bring and draw from as broad a um, foundation as possible. So I guess in that sense, my um, my search history is quite um, odd and varied. Yeah, it's it's a good answer. I um, I just wrote two <laughs> things. For a non-answer. Uh, no, no, it's all right. I just wrote um, uh, two things down while you're speaking. One was I really should add into that question, um, do you have any virtual mentors um, that you'd recommend? So... Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, and particularly you know, one of the things with, with COVID, I used to go to the states for a month a year uh, for my learning and to up, up, you know, upskill myself. You know, I haven't been able to do that, so I've got a series of virtual mentors, and you, you know, the nuggets. Um, uh, you know, people like Peter Diamandis. I don't know if you've heard of him. 
um, uh, he's behind the 10x challenge, and and Joe Polish is a marketing genius out of state. So you know, like, and I picked their nuggets. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. So I think um, I may change that question. And and interesting, why go to the states for a month a year? Why not go to Switzerland one year and the states the next quite, year yeah, and yeah, yeah, Nepal really another year? You know, I think for me, it's that um, that breadth of of input that we can give ourselves um, gives us the best chance at mm. at making new connections and and you know. Yeah, no, it's, no look, it's, 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 they're very, very, it's very good points. Um, any last piece of advice or parting words for a CEO or an aspiring CEO? Uh, this too shall pass. Uh, whether it's a good day or a bad day, this too shall pass. And I think that's, you know, that's definitely a double-sided coin. Of course, there are hard, hard days. Yes. And, of course, there are also amazing days. So don't get complacent when you're having a good run. Um, and and don't be deterred when you're having a bad run. You know, it, it, it'll it all pass way faster than often we'd like it to. So just be with it. Do your very best you can do with the information you have at any given time. Fabulous. Now, um, we talked a bit earlier. You know, one of the, the things that you know, I um, have had difficulty grasping about what you do is, you know, how does it you go? Know, like a picture paints a thousand words. So um, uh, Michelle's offered that if someone's interested interested in um, curious, that we might be able to put something together where they can come and do a try before you buy, perhaps. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I'm happy to uh, you know share a demonstration with anybody and let them in and have a play with the platform. But I, I'm also really aware that the you know organisations like ours who are working with emerging tech have an education responsibility too. So if anyone is just feeling a little bit stuck, um, yeah, happy to have a conversation at any time. You, know, I'm happy to do a little ask me anything. Um, right. And how do they find you? Uh, they can find me on LinkedIn. I'm happy to share my email address with you uh, and your your viewers right. here, of course, as well. And the company name is Curious, C-U-R-I-I-O-U-S. Yes, Curious because it's all... It's all about visual communication. I mean, I'm going to finish off with that. something I started. So I asked Michelle at the start, you know, the picture behind her, where it came from. I'm going to shorten the story a little bit and just say that uh, walking down the street in Bel Air in, in, in the US and sales sign. Can you tell us a little bit about that behind you and the one off to the, off to the side, Michelle? <laughs> it's a great story. Yeah, sure. Look, I mean, gosh, I thought a garage sale in Bel Air, what does that look like? And as I said, in amongst the stuffed Tanzanian lines and and crystal chandeliers that were bigger than my entire house, I found this wonderful cache of art by a gentleman called Steve Kaufman who was Andy Warhol's assistant. And I just think what an interesting journey he had. And he clearly, this is a, a screen print, um, and it's you can't see the detail there, but it's incredibly fine detail for a screen print. So, you know, I think it, it's a really interesting thing to uh, you know, to appreciate what he was exposed to and what he would have learned by proxy. I've got the other one that I showed you before is actually one of um, one of Andy Warhol's screens that Steve Kaufman did. But, you know, I, I, I think what an interesting character behind the character. Um, and so I fell in love with it a little bit, you know, to get a bit closer to his journey and a little bit because I love it. I'm curious. I was curious. You're curious. You've got to be curious. Sure. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's lovely. I really to enjoyed the conversation. Me too. Thank you so much.